Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So uh, Davida has a quick announcement uh, for us about the food, and we'll uh, reiterate this a little bit later. So uh, turn it over to Davida, and then we'll start singing. Okie dokie, welcome to Harvest Fest. As you can see, there's some tablecloths on the picnic tables. If it is a gold table located on the ends of the table grouping, that is for drinks and desserts. If it is a yellow, orange, or yellow table located in the middle towards the trees, that is for main dishes and sides. Once again, desserts and drinks on the ends, main dishes and sides in the middle. I feel like a flight attendant. Okay, you can do it. All right, raise your hand if you need a song sheet. We're gonna sing some praise songs here. Lord, we love you. Lord, we pray to be with you forever. Lord, we praise you. We adore you for everything you are. You are holy, perfect, always and forever. and keep singing. God, thank you that we could worship you this morning outside, uh, out in your creation, looking up at the sky. Thank you for the way that your creation uh, declares your glory. Thank you for this great country that we could uh, be able to worship you freely and uh, without fear of reparations from uh, the authorities like uh, our brothers and sisters who are worshiping in other countries underground in some places. Uh, hear our voices as we praise you. Uh, God, help us to remove any distractions from our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain tree, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign. Thought. 
life reflect the beauty of my Lord Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing So what you reign
flame. Sing it out. Everybody, and let's welcome Steve Marici. Good morning. Good to see everybody here at our annual Harvest Festival. Am I? I just. We'll get this sorted out. You guys need me to move back in further? Check, check. All right, we'll see if we can get this thing going here. Again, my name is Steve Ricci. Just super grateful to have you all out here this morning at our annual Harvest Festival. Great opportunity to come together as a family, spend time with each other, break bread. You know, I'll, I'll just go to a handheld. Bear with me for a second here. All right, that better? Yeah. Amen. Technology, you got to love it. I do want to say, though, and I do want us to give a special round of applause to our tech team, to our worship team. All they do, the early hours, and obviously at times like this, frustration. And just being a little real, I had a little bit of my own this morning. I was super fired up. Yesterday I went out and I found a screaming deal in Inglewood at the Super. I ended up with all these pumpkins for under 30 bucks. Here's the frustrating part. Back in this morning to unload them and those wonderful little brick things that are at the end of the stairs, my backup sensor didn't pick it up, and I put a nice little pinstripe down the side of my vehicle, but you know what? God gave it to me. Evidently, he wanted the additional pinstriping, and it's out of my system. I'm good to go. Needless to say, 30 bucks, $500, a little bit of a difference there, but amen. As you know, we're uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue our series this morning on spirit-filled people. And Brian started us up a couple weeks ago out of the book of Acts with the direction that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit had given the apostles. Ultimately, it was to wait on God the Father who was going to give them this incredible gift. And that was Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, that energy residing within the apostles, God's word, Jesus in the flesh. There's so many things that are such an integral part of what took place at the very beginning of Acts. And they waited, and they received that gift, and they went on from there to witness to the known world about the good news of Jesus Christ. We then heard the message a week later about a new transformed life through the waters of baptism. And we see that ushered in with the Jews there in Acts 2. But there's another group, we're familiar with the Gentiles, but there's another group that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this morning, and that's the Samaritans. Today, what I hope to leave you with is how clear and forceful the Holy Spirit is in each of our lives today. The significance of that Holy Spirit, and ultimately the unity that we know Jesus wanted. He prayed about it in John 17. And we can see through the book of Acts how significant unity was, how significant unity is today when it comes to the good news of Jesus Christ. The unity within our family when there are so many forces trying to separate us and drive us apart. You know, we have one of the most polarized nations, times in our nations ever when it comes to politics. And that's something I want to address in a, in a few moments here as well. But today, again, what I hope to leave you with is how clear and forceful the Holy Spirit was in building the unity of the early church and what that means for us today. You guys with me? You ready? I want you to hang in there with me for a couple minutes because I do want to spend a little bit of time on history. 
that's really significant. And uh, my other goal today is to come in at about half of what I normally would, which generally is around 40 to 43 minutes. I'm hoping to land this in less than 25. So a lot to cover here. Let's go ahead and pay attention. During the ministry of Jesus, there was contact with a group of people known as the Samaritans. And that's the third group that I wanted to talk about today. This race came about after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel around 721 B.C. Certain people from the nation of Israel stayed behind and intermarried with the Assyrians. And that's ultimately where the nation of Samaria, the Samaritans, came from. Because the Israelite inhabitants of Samaria had intermarried with foreigners, one of the things that became a part of that is they started to adopt some of their uh, time, aspects of worship. I mean, they were very idolatrous. It was a very idolatrous religion. And the Samaritans were generally considered half-breeds, and they were despised by the Jews. Now, the Jews, after the return from Babylon, began rebuilding the temple. And one of the first places we ever see mention of the Samaritans is in the book of Nehemiah. The Samaritans tried to halt the undertaking that Nehemiah himself had taken on with the rebuilding of the wall. And during that time, the Samaritans built for themselves a temple on Mount Gerizim, which the Samaritans claim was the designated place that Moses wanted the temple built. It's where the Jewish nation should worship. And this is one of the first places we see conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans in the book of Nehemiah. How many of you are familiar with the name Sambalot out of the book of Nehemiah? How many of you realize that he is that Samaritan that I'm referencing? I didn't even really know that until recently. I just thought it was one of the, the neighboring tribes that was given the Jews problems with what it was that they were attempting here. But again, in Nehemiah 2, verse 19, we see that Sambalot had some anger issues towards the Jews. In verse 19, it says, When Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab heard about our plans, this is Nehemiah speaking here, they started insulting us and saying, Just look at you. Do you plan to rebuild the walls of this city and rebel against the king? I answered, We're servants of the God who rules from heaven, and he will make our work succeed. So when we start rebuilding Jerusalem, but you have no right to any of its property because you have no part in its history. And what we see from this point forward is Samaria became a place of refuge from outlaws of Judea. The Samaritans were willing to receive anybody who would come to them, Jewish criminals, violators of Jewish laws, those who had been excommunicated. And these individuals found safety in Samaria, which ultimately what that did was just further fan the flame of hatred that existed between them and the Jews. So the Samaritans had their own temple, their own copy of the Torah, which to this day they adhere to the fact that it's only the first five books that are truly God's word. They have their own religious system. And today there's a group of about a thousand people in Israel that claim they are the descendants of the original Samaritans. And for centuries there were a large number of Samaritans who considered themselves distinct from the Jews. They fought to preserve the religious culture. Several hundred thousand Samaritans lived in the Holy Land at the time of Christ, but the war with the Byzantines, between them and the Byzantines around 529 AD and 531 AD led to almost the complete decimation of that population. And then the arrival, through the arrival of Islam, they were almost wiped completely off the face of the plan. But for those few Samaritans that are left, they protect their pre-captivity traditions as their central culture. They use an antique version of the Hebrew script, those first five books of the, uh, the Bible, the Pentateuch, that we're familiar with. They still sacrifice animals to this day for the atonement of sin, which is something the Jews gave up centuries ago. And because it hosts the oldest Jewish temple at Mount Gerizim, the Samaritans believe that their location of worship is far superior and holier to that of the temple in Jerusalem. So with that, we transition to the New Testament. We have all these things that led to irreconcilable differences between the Jews and the Samaritans so that the Jews regarded the Samaritans as the worst of the human race. And in regards to Jesus and some interaction with the religious leaders of his day, we can get a little bit of a taste how they even felt about Jesus. In talking with the religious leaders in John 8, verse 48, interaction between the Jews and Jesus they asked this question, aren't we right in saying that you, Jesus, 
are Samaritan and demon-possessed. And in a conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman, we we're told the following in John 4, 9, the Samaritan woman says to him, How is it you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And then in John 4, verse 19, there's an issue among the Jews and the Samaritans as to where the proper place of worship is. And the following exchange takes place between Jesus and a Samaritan woman in verse 19. She says, Sir, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So as we go on, we see that the Holy Spirit wants to make things clear as to who Jesus had come for. And it wasn't a matter of being a Jew or a Gentile or a Samaritan, but a worshiper of God the Father. That's who God was looking for, those who would worship him and help be a part of the kingdom and the ushering in of the kingdom on earth. Last week, Daniel Kim took us through Acts 7 and the convictions of a man by the name of Stephen, which ultimately culminated in his death. And continuing forward in history of the early church, we're going to pick up in Acts 8, verse 1. It says, And Saul was giving approval to his death, referencing Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So what we see happening right here is the Holy Spirit working through the persecution of the church and how that led to the spread of Christianity in those early days as those that were filled with the Spirit fled Jerusalem. In Acts 8, verse 4, we'll pick it up. It says, Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Verse 12. We read about a group of Samaritans who believed Philip. It says, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. However, when we get to Acts 8.16, we find that the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, and they had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if we go back to Acts 2.38 with the Jews, what was the direction that Peter gave the people after explaining to them that our sin led to the crucifixion of Christ? We, we know the passage, Acts 2.36. People were cut to the heart and they asked, what should we do? And Peter's response was, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we know that Christians receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, which is when this vessel is purified through the waters of baptism. Therefore, the Holy Spirit can reside within it. Question, why had the believers in Samaria not received the Holy Spirit yet in Acts 8? And how was it that the Samaritans who Philip evangelized did not receive the Holy Spirit? Well, God's always got a plan, amen? First, it's good to remember that the book of Acts is a history of how God started the church. It's the record of the transition between the Old Covenant and what we have today is the New Covenant, the New Testament, the new agreement that we have with Christ. And much of what we see in the book of Acts relates to that specific transition. The Samaritan's manner of receiving the Spirit should be taken ultimately for what it is, which is an accurate account of what happened in this particular case. It, not, it should not be perceived as the overriding norm here. The believing Samaritans had baptized in water, but for God's own reasons, they had not yet been baptized in the Spirit. Second, we should note that the Spirit did come upon the Samaritans in Acts 8. We'll see in verses 14 through 17, if you'll read with me. It says, When the apostles in Jerusalem had heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. 
When they arrived, they prayed for them, and they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. They did not receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles Peter and John were present. And God had some very good reasons for this playing out the way that it did, and that they needed to wait until Peter and John were there. And with that, the Holy Spirit was sent to the Samaritans. First, who was given the keys to the kingdom? Matthew 16, verse 19, we know that that responsibility, that direction, that oversight was something that being given to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 19. Peter was present, and he was the main spokesman at Pentecost, right? In Acts 2, when the Spirit was given to the Jews, Peter was present. In Acts 8, when the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit, who was present? Peter was present. When the Spirit was given to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house in Acts 10, who was present? Peter was present. So Peter was present when the, the Spirit was given to the Jews. He was present when it was given to the Samaritans, which is kind of interesting, as half-breeds, right there in the center. You had Jews that had intermarried. So you have the Jews, the Jews that had intermarried, and then the Gentiles who received the Holy Spirit in Peter's presence. Peter was used to open the door to each of these groups of people. Let's go ahead and continue here. In Ephesians 2.20, we also know that the church was built on the foundation of who? The apostles and the prophets. Ephesians 2 verse 20 reads, Philip had been a deacon... Oh, I mean, that's in light of Ephesians 2, 20. Again, the foundation of the early church was built on who? The apostles and the prophets. Now, Philip had been a deacon in the church in Jerusalem, but he was not one of the 12 apostles. Peter and John needed to be in Samaria, Samaria for the official start of the Samaritan church, just as they had been in Jerusalem for the start of the Jewish church. Now, another reason would be that the presence of Peter and John kept the early church unified. As we've heard today, there was great animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans in John 4, verse 9. Think about this for a moment. If the church in Samaria had begun on its own with no connection to the Jewish church, what would that have looked like? How would the Jews have felt about it? Just based on culturally where they were at. There would have been a huge issue. The Jews would never ex have accepted the Samaritans having been saved as Christians. Again, because the Samaritans were known historically by Jews as corruptors of Judaism. So would that have not carried over to their conversion as Christians? Isn't it the possibility that they would have been known as being corruptors of Christianity? So the Samaritans were part of the same church. That's why Peter and John needed to be there. They were present to witness this gift of the Spirit being given to the Samaritans. God's message here is that church in Samarita, Samaria was not some idolatrous startup, but that they had received the same exact Spirit. Galatians 3, verse 26 reads, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. So again, we have Peter and John who are eyewitnesses to this, and their testimony was clear that what had happened in Samaria was not some separate religious movement. Through this, God prevented the early church from immediately dividing into different sects. The Lord took pains to ensure the unity of this early church, and Jesus had commanded that the gospel be preached in Samaria in Acts 1, verse 8. And Philip, the evangelist, obeyed that command, and God blessed it. Amen? Coming in for a landing. Whatever animosity existed between the Jews and the Samaritans was overcome here by the unity of the Spirit. And the church today should continue, as it says in Ephesians 4, 20, 4 verses 2 through 6. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, 
just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You know, it's amazing. It doesn't take a whole lot. We know in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, people very easily get caught up in personalities. Some follow Cephas, some follow Paul, some follow Apollos, but the reality that Paul corrected them on was what? There's only one person that we follow, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 3, I want to go back to this for just a moment because, again, we live in a society where polarization is the norm today. And in verse 3 it reads, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I'm just going to put it out there real frank to everyone that's here. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, there is absolutely no place for you on social media to be engaged in talks about politics that are polarizing between brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely no place. What I would like to see is the amount of energy that's poured into this stuff that just separates people. Why don't you spend the same time on social media posting the good news about Jesus Christ? Amen? Again, what I hope that each of us leave with here today is how clear and forceful the Holy Spirit was in building unity of the early church and how that contributed to the spread of the gospel. The reason this is important for us today, that this is a, there's a direct correlation for each of us here today in our role as disciples in building God's church. How? Jesus had expectations on unity, and how powerful that is as we live as true Christians with the Holy Spirit residing within us. We go back to the book of Genesis, and we can see the power of unity when it came to a group of people coming together and with that unity building this incredible temple to the heavens. It wasn't for the wrong, it wasn't for the right purpose. There was a little bit of pride involved. Imagine if we had that degree of unity today, how that would transform this planet, how it would eliminate the disunity and the polarization and the hatred that is so prevalent. Many of you are probably aware that there was a mass shooting in a Jewish synagogue yesterday in Pittsburgh. Eleven people were killed as they were worshiping. The kind of unity that Jesus calls for gives us the ability to overcome those types of things. So we're either moved by the Spirit to share the gospel of Christ, or we choose not to listen to the Spirit and hoard the good news for ourselves. Today, as we take time to sit down to a meal with one another, let's make sure that you share with your guests over lunch just not the food that you brought, but that you share how the gospel of Christ, the good news about Jesus, changed your lives. If you're our guest today, I want to encourage you, in light of whoever it is that brought you out, if they haven't offered that good news to you yet, that you please ask them to share with you what that good news is. The real, authentic, good news that miraculously changes lives, changed my life, has changed your lives, and brings true joy, purpose, and peace. Not only to our own lives, but within our own communities, prayerfully the world. Amen? Let's go ahead and go to the Father and pray for communion. Father, you truly are an amazing God. As we go back through the Bible in its entirety, I just personally cannot understand the, the amount of patience and love and grace that you've extended to each of us through centuries of, I, I can't imagine as a father it being anything more than disappointment when time after time after time, all you did was call men and women to love you, men and women to put you first, and even in my own life, how many times I've violated that love and trust that you've demonstrated for me. But we come before you right now to thank you so much for the gift that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Thank you that you would see fit to send him down to earth, to walk with us, to participate with us, to understand everything that we go through in these frail bodies that we have, and being willing to subject himself not only to that, but taking on all of our sin and dying on a cross 
so we would have the opportunity to be clothed in Christ and be perceived as your own children, adopted into your family, given the gift of salvation and eternity with you in heaven as long as we love you. Father, again, thank you for that. As we take the time to pass the fruit of the vine and the, the bread that represents your body, I pray that we can all give pause to what an incredible gift we've been given, that we can reflect on the day that we were baptized and our sins were forgiven and that we were added to your kingdom and what that looked for our lives then as well as how that looks for our lives now and the generations to come. Father, uh, please bless this time together. I do want to petition you on behalf of those that lost loved ones, on behalf of those that died in the shooting yesterday, that, Father, they'll be able to look to you. Be, this will be an opportunity for the ability to see you and understand the need for you. And, Father, we are so frail on our own. But with you, not only we can live life to the full now, but we can spend life in heaven with you for all eternity. Well, I love you. Thank you so much for this time together. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
continue on climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't Thank you, Paulette, and uh, thank you, church. It's great to sing together. You can have a seat for a second. We're going to take up our weekly uh, offering as well as pray for the food we're about to enjoy. Uh, this is an offering we take up every week to support the needs of the church. If you're a guest today, uh, this is not for you, but, uh, and uh, many of us give online, but we do want uh, to, to pass it around to those who would like to contribute uh, for the work of the church. And uh, you know, when you think about how much God has blessed us and how God has grafted us in, uh, we are so, deserve, so undeserving of his love, as we just sang about. And uh, Steve talked about the Samaritans and how, uh, how they were viewed by the Jews. And uh, the, the Gentiles had it even worse. And most of us are Gentiles. Uh, we were not part of God's uh, story until, but we were always part of his story. And that God had to, to, to bring a, a people, a chosen people, to b bring the Messiah that would be for all people and all nations and all cultures and all languages and everywhere and every tongue. And that's what we're part of now. Uh, because of the grace of God and because of the grace of Jesus, we are a part of his chosen family, even though we don't feel like it sometimes. Uh, but uh, So it's awesome to be able to celebrate that and celebrate the unity that we have in Christ. And really contributing uh, financially is a way to celebrate the unity that we have. So let's pray, and then uh, we'll have uh, some direction for the food and some announcements. God, thank you to be able to worship you. Uh, thank you to be able to praise you. Thank you to be able to give back to you right now uh, from out of the bounty that you've blessed us with. And uh, thank you for this food that we're about to enjoy, and uh, thank you for the fellowship we could have together. Thank you for the blessings that come through Christ and uh, through this family of believers. Uh, thank you that we can worship you uh, freely as, as we prayed earlier, and uh, bless the rest of our day today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Davida is going to come up here and give us a few more, a uh, little bit more direction about the food. As she's making her way up there, i got a couple announcements for us. Um, if you're visiting with us, we'd love to have you come back. We normally meet at Miracosta at 1030 on uh, Sundays, 10, uh, 1030 at Miracosta High School. However, next week we will not be meeting at that time because most of our marrieds are, uh, married couples are going away for a retreat in Palm Springs this coming weekend. Uh, those of, uh, that are not going to that retreat, and then all of our singles and college students, everybody, we will be meeting at Maricosta, but we're doing it later in the evening uh, so that to give the families a chance to get back uh, in town. So that will be at 6 p.m. at Miracosta, and that also is going to be coming together with all these other churches that are part of our fellowship of churches called Coastal LA. So there'll be probably about five, 600 uh, people gathered at Miracosta in the big auditorium uh, this Sunday at 6 p.m., and then after that, we'll be there on Sundays at 10.30 also, I heard uh, we have a special uh, engagement that happened this morning. Sid and Mariah got engaged this morning. 
Congratulations, guys. So that is uh, exciting. That's the coming together of two South Bay families. That was an arranged marriage, right, years ago. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's super happy for you guys. Uh, Davida's going to give us some instructions for the food, and then we'll close with a final song. Okay, so everyone has brought some tasty things. I believe that deep in my heart. But if you're interested in food first, on the yellow, orange, and yellow tables, there's plates, there's utensils, there's napkins. You line up for main dishes and sides. We start at the end closer to the sidewalk back there. And then for drinks and desserts, there's some cups, there's also bottles of water, there's ice chests uh, with ice on the gold tables on the end. But you're like, where am I going to sit to eat my food? You may have brought your own chair, but back there under the pergola, I just looked it up on Google to make sure I said the right word. The pergola, there are some tablecloth tables um, right, with, um, that you can sit at and eat your food and fellowship. There's also a set right here. So feel free to get your plate and mingle and enjoy the Harvest Fest, OK? All right, let's stand and sing a final song. And then uh, there's going to be a costume contest happening for the kids pretty shortly after and a costume contest for the dogs. <laughs> so stick around for the food. If you didn't bring anything, if you're a guest and you just happen to find us, you happen to walk by, stick around for the food. We'll have plenty. God will provide. And uh, we'd love to have you join us. So let's uh, sing this final song, Your Grace is Enough. Your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. Sing it out. Yeah. 